Hello and a very warm welcome to The Real Talk. How are you doing? How was the week? Thank you for sparing time to join us for yet another conversation that I have no doubt you're going to enjoy. We are coming to you from Mythos Boutique Hotel in Kiovu. Our guest today is a wildlife photographer and the author of a book. I don't know if you've seen it somewhere in the bookstore, Falling for the Birds of Kigali. You will be getting to meet him in just a bit. My name is Jackie Lubasi. The hashtag we're using is the real talk. Please share it. If you have any questions or comments as we move on, you post it there and both the guest and I will respond. Time for me to introduce Will Wilson. Good to see you, Will. Lovely to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me to come. The pleasure is all mine. So you're Will Wilson. I we're am, shorten, yes. we, we sh When somebody's called Wilson, call them Will. How did you end up being called Will Wilson? <laughs> so, okay, um, Will came about when I first joined the army. Oh. So when you first joined the British army, you're called by your last name. Mm -hmm. And that was then shortened from Wilson to Will. So mm -hmm. my actual name is Jonathan Wilson. No um, way. Yep. I haven't seen that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that coming. <laughs> so you're Jonathan Wilson. I am, yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's lovely. Tell us about yourself, Will. Take us back to your childhood. Where were you born? You already mentioned uh, joining the military, but that I'm sure will come on later. But if you can just take us back to where your life story sure. began. So I, um, I was born in Wales. I've got an older brother of four years. Um, and then at the age of four, my family and I moved to Hong Kong. My dad was in the Navy and then later worked for the Hong Kong government. Mm -hmm. So we spent our life there. So I guess early memories are living in high-rise apartment blocks, going on boat trips, exploring the islands, um, eating Cantonese food, playing by the pool, those kind of things. Those are there. Uh, and typhoons as well, which got lots of those. Oh, yeah, um, typhoons as well, yeah. yeah. So those are, those are, I guess, childhood memories for me. Yeah. Uh, how was it for you? Was it just easy to move in and connect with... Uh, um, your age mates in Hong Kong? Uh, yeah, pretty Hong much. Kong? I mm. think there was, at that time especially, um, back in the mid to late 80s, there was quite a lot of expats over there. So there was quite a large community there. Mm. Um, and you'd pl I'd find friends within the apartment blocks we were living okay. and then at the pools or the beaches we were playing at. So, yeah. yeah, nice you and easily easy. made friends, I, never yeah. felt uh, secluded. In no, I've, uh, that's probably one of my uh, strengths, my ability to talk and I'm quite happy to meet and be, greet and be with people and make friends, so, yeah. 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 Oh, great. <laughs> what kind of uh, family were you raised in? You mentioned your dad was uh, in the Navy. Mm -hmm. Was it a happy, cheerful um, family? Was it uh, strict parenting? Um, more, more to the latter, quite strict, um, I'd say. Um, but no, it was good. Um, yeah, it was, it was quite a strict, as you say, my dad was in the Navy. Um, and probably something we'll come on to in a bit, but I, from the age of eight, I was sent off to boarding school back in the UK, in Wales. Oh, um, initially in Wales, and then to actually Naval College, um, just outside London. And both of those schools followed in my uh, family's tradition, being quite strict, so mm. corporal punishment was a thing. Um, oh. So quite strict, yeah. Mm. You, you've <laughs> got a bit of that, eh? the punishment? Uh, yes, so I think, what was the worst punishment you received in that street school? Uh, being a cane across the backside, across the back of the legs. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. And Many canes. You know, I ask that because when you talk about corporal punishment, this part of the world, yeah. I'll tell you there's a time I was told, lie down, and I was given 50 canes, and everywhere from head to toe. Ouch. Ouch, ouch. Not, yeah. not so that. Was yours more to that extent? Not to that extent, <laughs> thankfully. Um, no. Uh, less, less, a lot less than 50, but oh, it was man. still there. Um, and I think... I don't know, I kind of rebelled against that somewhat. Okay. Um, but yeah, so primary and secondary education was, was a bit of a handful, is probably mm. a nice way of putting it. Um, mm. The fact that from the age of eight you're away, you don't see your parents, you only yeah. see them three times a year. I, don't get me wrong, I think boarding school for some kids are great, and if they take to it, then that's awesome. But I but wasn't I, one of those. I, I personally feel like, yeah, much as it's great, not as early as seven, eight years. Correct. Yeah. yeah. I go along exactly with those lines. Yeah. yeah. No, completely. How were you in school? Um, I was happier on the sports pitch, so playing rugby, hockey, cricket, um, those kind of ideas than I was actually in the classroom. Mm. It was fine. It was going through it, and I, I did it, but I was more happier outside and on the sports pitch than I was yeah. inside. Yeah. Um, Any leadership positions that you held in school? 
Uh, no, to be honest, I think, as I say, I was a bit of a rebellious young <laughs> lad. It's probably a nice but way of putting it. You know what? It's actually certain positions were reserved for the rebellious students. Our teachers used that to tame the rebellious ones. I, I wish they'd probably done it with me. Um, they, they did didn't. do that. No, no, I was a sports captain on the rugby team and on the cricket pitch, but not in the classroom or the wider school. Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah. What were you passionate about? What was your dream career? As a child, you know, yep. now you begin to understand everything. Yep. You're thinking, yep. one day I want to join the Navy, one day I want to be yep. that. Um, to be honest, it was just to be outside. Um, I, as I said, my, when I was happiest the most at school was when I was on the sports pitch. Mm -hmm. So potentially it was something to go down those lines and do, be a professional sportsman. So as, yeah. as a child, that's kind of what I pushed towards, I think. What happened to that dream? So did you pursue it? Did you play I did not, no. I did not. Um, so when I, when I became 18, rather than sitting my... Uh, exams to go to university, I left, in, I left school and joined the army. So uh, um, I went straight into the army at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't go to university until my mid-30s and early 40s. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that, that's kind of the path I took. Um, so your memory in the military will begin at the age of 16? 18, so just Sorry, 18. 18. Yeah, 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 just 18. Um, so yeah, I joined when I was Take 18. Take there, yeah. Well, was it hard for you to decide to join the army, or um, is it something that you did easily and your parents encouraged you to? No, they definitely didn't encourage me. I think, if anything, me joining the army with my dad in the navy was a, a bit of a snub to him. Um, uh, not intentionally. I think with hindsight, looking back, it probably was, but it wasn't intentional. Um, so I joined what we called the, the infantry or the household division. So deploying in the infantry onto combat operations from the age of 18 um, and served a lot of service. But then when we were back in the UK or in, based in London, we'd be doing ceremonial duties. So you'd have seen in London with the big black hats and red coats outside Buckingham yeah. Palace or Windsor Castle. So that's what my regiment did as well. Uh -huh. So I guess the equivalent here in Rwanda would be the Republican Guard. Yeah. Um, so I did that for the first half of my career. Um, then I went and did a selection process and further training and specialized in intelligence collection, so human intelligence, agent handling. So I did for my second half of my career, I did that both in home and abroad doing covert operations. <laughs> what does that entail? Um, I, a little bit of, you know, we've, so we've seen it in the movies, but yep. now that I get to sit with somebody who's done this yep. practically, yep. please take me through it. Um, so agent handling, what is it? It's um, recruiting and running agents to gather information and intelligence is probably the easiest and most concise way of yeah. putting it. Um, and you would go to any extent to recruit an agent? There's to the extent of marrying them and... No, yeah. there are, there are um, parameters of where you need to be and legal parameters that you work within. Mm. Um, so marrying wouldn't, wouldn't have been one I'd go down, I won't lie. Um, <laughs> but that's the kind of, yeah, so that's, yeah. that's where I was. And I was doing that job in Afghanistan when I met Anna. So we met in Afghanistan, my wife now. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so we, we met there. We will get to that. I, yep. Yes, I had spared that question. I wanted to know how you two met. So your time in the I mean, how long did you spend there? And then... 22 years, just over 22 years. Why did you um, leave? You were still young. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't feel it, I won't lie. Um, so in the British Army, when you get to 22 years, that, or at least with the contract I was on, that's when you receive a full pension, when you leave. Okay. So I could come out, and then monthly I would receive a pension from the, from the Army for mm -hmm. the rest of my life. After 22? After 22 years. And you still receive it until today? Correct, yeah. Oh. And we'll continue to do in, until, until the end. Amazing, um, yeah. So, so that was kind of um, a thought process of wanting to leave and do something else. Mm -hmm. And you'd said, yes, at 40 you're quite young. Um, in reality, uh, my knees, back, and uh, and shoulders, and all the rest of it. My body would would suggest otherwise. At forty, um, you were tired. I was tired, and yeah. also the younger guys coming through. You have mm. to compete with them, and it was a time for me. I think I'd said that's enough, and I also I felt like I'd been to enough places, done enough stuff, mm. that I wanted to now move on with my life and yeah. uh, with Anna and have a family. Oh, so yeah. it was kind of that, and. Going back to university, it was in the lead up or the build up to leaving that I then went back mm -hmm. to university whilst I was still serving and did it online or distant learning, um, a first class honours degree in intelligence and international relations. So I did that to then leave um, uh, and then started my own security consultancy business. So doing capacity building, training and mentoring 
for both for governments, but then also private sector clients as well. Mm -hmm. So that saw me travel all over the all over the world, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, but I got had an epiphany is probably the best way of explaining it. I was abroad. I just left Anna, who just given birth to our daughter Charlotte. She was three weeks old, mm -hmm. and I found myself in a place where I'd found myself many times before in the military, but without the same logistical support, financial support, or medical support. And I was like, what am I doing here? So I had um, a marriage before Anna, and I have two older kids from that marriage. And being in the army, I spent a lot of, I, I missed out on a lot of their, um, the times in their lives, the, big, the key yeah. moments. I missed out on those milestones. Mm -hmm. and with Charlie just being born, I didn't want to miss out on those again. That's okay, yeah. So I decided right from now on, I'll finish this contract, but from now on I won't take any more unless I'm in the same country that Anna that is. Anna is. Yeah, so I finished that, went back, um, and Anna had just got a job as a deputy director of development in Khartoum in Sudan. Mm -hmm. So we moved to Sudan as a family. Charlie was five months old at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and I did some smaller contracts for some of the embassies. Um, but I was like, I want to move away from the security sector um, and look at the development and humanitarian sector. So I went back to university and did a master's in security conflict and international development. So that was the aim of then moving me into those sort of sectors. And then uh, a m military coup happened in Khartoum. Mm -hmm. um, and it got... You guys were there when We were there when it happened, yeah. And we got yeah. evacuated back to the UK twice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we then came back after that and then COVID hit. And so we got evacuated yet again. Um, and so I was kind of at the point of now, what, what comes next? So we returned to Sudan, and Anna then got the job here as a development director at the British High Commission in Kigali. Yeah. So February 2021, we came to Kigali. Yeah. Um, and because it was still in the COVID lockdown period, we were going up and down into lockdown, coming back out, I spent uh, quite a lot of time both looking after Charlie while Santa was at work, but also going into the garden uh, with my camera, uh, photographing the visitors that came. Mm. And this kind of kicked my passion that, so it took me till I was maybe 43 to find my passion. And those are Till you were 43. And so wow. photography and, and has always know, been- I hope my viewer uh, should get that clearly. There are times it will take you longer yeah, to figure completely. out what your passion 100%. is. 100%. Yeah. My, my passion has always been photography, but so while studying for my master's degree, I also then started a bachelor's degree in photography to try and understand all the theory You did this too concurrently? Yes. So whilst doing that, and I was acutely aware of the other people or the other students on my course were either pet photographers or they were wedding photographers. They'd found their niche. And I was like, at that point, I hadn't. So I was photographing landscape, street, portraits, uh, wildlife, all sorts of stuff. And I was like, I must be doing something wrong. So I spoke to my professor and said, look, what's this, what am I doing wrong? And he's going, he said, actually, you're not doing anything wrong. Keep doing what you're doing. Because when you find the area that actually sets your photography alight, everything you photograph will turn to gold. And I was like, okay. And only since coming here to Rwanda has my phot photography turned to gold, in my view, anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and that's for birds. And Anna would probably describe me as a bit of a bird geek, nerd now. So I started photographing the birds. <laughs> but we, then we all would do. That's <laughs> all you post. <laughs> yes. No, completely. Completely. I'll yeah. give you that. But it's, for me, it's um, when, when you, it doesn't matter what subject you're photographing. If you understand the subject and you delve deeply into that subject, you're going to create better photographs because of the, the connection between the photographer and his subject. So mm -hmm. for me, I then went back to university, or, or I studied with Cornell University, doing online course to understand bird biology and physiology, to understand their behavior. And that's kind of what gets me. Um, so birders are normally on a spectrum. On the one side, there's, they have a checklist, and they want to see new bird, new bird, new bird. On the other side of that spectrum is someone who can quite happily watch that same bird for their hour and see how it behaves, how it feeds, how it interacts with other species. I'm probably on that side, and I love to watch and see how they interact. So mm. to do that, you needed to learn. And so that's what I did. Yeah. Um, and then the, the birds I photographed in my garden, I posted online, um, had a really good reaction. And organizations, as well as people, were getting in touch and asking me to work with them. So mm. that's kind of how it's, so it's gathered pace, yeah. Amazing. That's how it became the, the focus yeah, <laughs> of your no, life, you know? Because that's what so. you do now, yes. and you're yeah. deeply invested in it. Completely I am, yeah. No, completely I am. It's, yeah. 
as I think we'll talk about later with mm. Anna, it's, yeah, it's, it's helped me a lot, it both has. with my, my ability to keep going and process stuff. Mm. And, and I'm, as I say, I'm sure we'll talk about that in a, in a bit. Exactly. Yeah. So your first camera, the one you had when you had just moved in and you were taking the small, small pictures, talk to us from that transition, from that small camera to what you use yep. today, because I imagine it must be a serious It's equipment. slightly different, yeah. I mean, my, my photography journey started back probably about 2010. And Anna and I went on our first safari. I say she forgot, she says I forgot to pack the camera. So I had an iPhone and a pair of binoculars on safari trying to capture photographs of animals. And you can imagine how rubbish they were. <laughs> our guide and driver was a, was a photographer. And so he was showing us the photos he was capturing. And I was just like, like comparing to what there was no comparison <laughs> <laughs> but that kind of flicked my switch of wanting to learn more so we went back and, and I bought my first camera for my birthday yeah. um, and it kind of processed from there um, mm. and so yeah coming out here yeah. Uh, the lens was uh, quite small and it's I've been investing as I've been going on mm. um, it's it's interesting because it, they are. It's a, it is an investment, yeah. but it's the equivalent of someone in a business suit or a working dress that they wear to go to the office, yeah. investing in how they look. It's the same. It's the equipment you need to do your job. Yeah. And that's is this something you would it. encourage someone to pursue? For example, there's this person who's starting small, and they're wondering, will this take care of my bills? Will it, you know, pay? I, I think is that something you can encourage them. It's, an, it's an, that's a really interesting question. I think as a passion, you need to keep going, and if it's what if it's your passion, then yes. I think it's a hard um, area to get into. And there's, I don't know, there's a perception of um, professional photographers for clients initially to go, well, I will give you exposure. Oh. And I was like, well, exposure doesn't pay bills. Yeah. So it's kind of it that mentality. in the media as well. I'm sure, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So that, that whole concept, it's a hard one to nut to crack, but when you do crack it, it yeah, it goes. Um, yeah. And I can't overstate the importance of social media um, and being able to get your work out there for people to see. Mm. Um, that, for me, is the only way it progressed for me. So, Would you say there are any businesses you've gotten through social media? Uh, yes. Okay. Well, business, yes. Working with gorilla doctors. So the wildlife vets that mm. work after the mountain gorillas here in Rwanda, but also in Uganda and the Congo. So I've been working with them to support, well, supporting them to document the work that they're doing to conserve and, and treat the, uh, their patients. Yeah. So I, that was um, an absolute privilege, that, yeah. an absolute privilege to be able to go and see and work and document the work that they're doing. It's, yeah. it's some amazing work. Um, also, a company got in touch with me, Afri Landscapes, who were yeah. basically developing Nyandungu Eco Park. And that was my initial yeah. entry when they were developing the site. I went down there and started photographing the birds so they could understand the baseline of what their restoration was the, as a short-term success, how, what was happening with regards to the bird life that was coming to the park. Mm. And that's just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, oh, and so, it's, so that I was ask, great. I ask because we spend a lot of time on social media, but a lot of us also don't know the power that social media has. Yep. And sometimes we're not intentional. We just post things for the sake of posting. Yep. And yet when you're intentional, it could pay off. Exactly, heavily. no completely. Yeah. Let's go back to you meeting Anna in Afghanistan. You both were there working. Yes. Then how did you bump into each other? Was it in a restaurant or were you trying to <laughs> recruit so, someone? <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. Um, so we were in Helmand province in southern Afghanistan. Um, I was doing my thing and Anna was doing socioeconomic development, working. She was running a team, multinational team, trying to work with the government of, of Afghanistan to try and develop the, uh, uh, the province itself. Um, and we actually met because there were civilians there, on the, there was a base, so there wasn't any restaurants. It was a small forward operating base. But the civilians had their own bar, and I went into the bar, and I met Anna at the bar. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it was, that's how were we met. Were you looking to, no, were you looking not at for all. a partner? No, not at all. I'd, I'd separated from my first wife just over a year before, and so I thought, and I had two kids, and I thought, my chance at happiness and love, done. <laughs> and Afghanistan's not really the place that you expect to find love. So no, I wasn't looking at <laughs> you all. You weren't looking. Not at all. Um, but it's interesting because I think uh, in somewhere like Afghanistan, you're in an enclosed environment. So it's very, it's like your relationship initial dates or would be going to a get to the coffee shop and getting a coffee together. But it was all on fast forward. It there was no gaps between it. So it was all yeah. uh, compounded, which was great. 
I loved it. Don't get me wrong, I loved it. Yeah. Um, and it was awesome. So that's how we met. Yeah. Um, and yeah, haven't looked back since. Oh, haven't looked back no, she's, since. A, she's a lovely person and you two make such a lovely couple. Thank you. And together with Charlie, we will get to talk more about Anna and I don't know if you have, if you follow her on social media, follow Will, you'll also be aware of the, their journey with cancer and what they are, the, the, how far they have come with it. And then the diagnosis having declared cancer free. That story Will is going to say, let me not preempt it. Please keep watching. We are on uh, Rwanda Television on YouTube. Go there, share the link with friends, family, so that we have as many people as possible catching the conversation. And you should use the hashtag, The Real Talk Online. Glad to have you with us on The Real Talk. My name is Jackie and my guest is Will. He's a wildlife photographer and author of the book Falling for the Birds of Kigali. He's got a second one coming up. You will get to hear about it. And we're getting to know more about him, his work, the passion for photography, and not just any photography, but wildlife photography. We will get back to your passion. Let's talk cool. about you and Anna and yep. the test that you faced as a family. It's been over a year, slightly over a year now since yes. that news was broken to you. If you can share that with yeah, us. Yeah, of well. course. Um, so it was December 2022. Um, Anna found a lump in her breast. Uh, here in Rwanda and went and got it checked and had an ultrasound and then w had a lump that was biopsied and that came back and telling us it was cancer. So the medical providers at the High Commission sent her back to the UK to London to a hospital back there and she received care through the NHS. Um, so at this time uh, Charlie and I were still back here in Rwanda um, so at the end of Charlie's term we then went back with, to be with her and support her through that. Um, and she had a mastectomy operation in January and then went through chemotherapy for four and a half months. Um, so Charlie and I would go back during half terms and holidays, otherwise we'd be back here um, and I'd be looking after Charlie. Um, and that's probably something we'll talk about in a bit. Um, so it, it's been, yes it's been hard. Mm -hmm. So we went back at the end of the summer of 2023. Charlie and I went back to be with her, with Anna for the last, her last round of chemo. And then we came back out together. Uh, and then back in the country for three weeks. And whilst Anna was back having chemotherapy, she had a full skin check of the moles to see and to get them checked. We were in Rwanda for three weeks and Anna received a second call that she had one of the uh, moles she had on the side of her face was actually a melanoma. So she had skin cancer. So she had to go back again for another four or five weeks to have an operation and then recover from that to then come back out. So October time she came back out last year and that was free from cancer. So she beat ke cancer twice. Mm -hmm. um, it's yeah. She's an inspiring woman. Uh, her courage and resilience through the whole of it has, mm. has blown me away. And I'm, since coming back, I'm eternally grateful that I have my wife back and my daughter has her mum back. Mm. Um, so I've, I decided to try and um, show how grateful I am and, and, and show that. So I decided to try and raise some money. First of all, raise awareness about the importance of early detection, not just mm. in breast cancer, but in the other cancers as well, and, and what that means for positive outcomes and outlooks for treatment, um, as well as try and raise some money for cancer research on a global scale, but also um, a charity called World Child Cancer, and they help fund treatment for kids across the world where they can't afford to actually get to the treatment themselves. Mm -hmm. So our house in Kigali is 9,845 kilometers from the hospital that Anna received treatment in the UK. So October each year is ca uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and the last day of that I started a challenge to virtually row on an indoor row machine, on an indoor bike, and when I'm walking out uh, with my camera, to cover that distance within nine months, which is her active treatment. So yes, she's still receiving monitoring treatment, but she yeah. wasn't in active treatment. So I'm doing a minimum of four, an averaging on 40 kilometers a day. So that's roughly a, mar a distance of a marathon that I'm covering you know, I, every day. I, I saw your last post. Where had you reached? You're in some country. <laughs> 
Uh, yes, we've gone through Nigeria, Niger, <laughs> Central African Republic, um, and so it's it's plotting up slowly. So this I'd is a virtual trip. Yep. You said how many kilometers? 9,845. 9, 9, yeah. So I'm 4,600 kilometers in, nearly halfway. So yeah, it's a long journey, um, yeah. but it's it's raising awareness and funds for both cancer research and actually treatment of, for children and, with and cancer. And this is your way of showing how grateful yes. you are. Yes, yeah, completely. What impact did this have on your family? So a massive separation, obviously, is with Charlie and I being here in Rwanda when Anna was back home. Um, and so we were... Anna and I were very open with Charlie to explain what was going on. So Charlie's four and a half when this was going on, now five, um, or five and a half now, so she was four and a half. So trying to explain to her that mum had a lump, we'd found a lump and she needed to have it taken out um, and that she'd need to go back and have medication and keep doing that to get rid of it and make sure it didn't come back. Mm. So, and she was, well, like her mum, she's resilient. She was okay, understood. And so we were back in the UK when Anna had the operation. And I went to drop Anna off and pick her up from the, from the surgery and bring her home. So little Charlie went to spend time with her grandparents. Um, she came back the following day. I opened the flat door. In comes Charlie, pushes past me. Mum, yes, looking for mom. show me. Okay. okay. And she saw it. She saw the scar and she was like, okay. And she's, she, that's, she's like, fine. Mm -hmm. So she's been very much. Is it a big fact. scar? It's quite a, a cr across her chest, yeah. So quite a big one. Yeah. Um, but she was very matter of fact. She's like, okay, mm -hmm. all right, fine. And that was it. Mm -hmm. um, so she's been really resilient with it. I think less so with the skin cancer and going back again. Because I think she'd processed, like I think we all had, that um, the cancer, the treatment had done, out we come, and we're now back as a family unit back in Rwanda. Mm. And then straight away, three weeks later, that rug was pulled away and Anna had to go again. Yeah. So it took a bit more uh, discussing, but I think, um, yeah, they've both been resilient yeah. as hell, yeah, and it's yeah. been amazing to be. You know, I'm so happy that you know you have overcome it as a family, and the fact that you're also raising funds because cancer treatment is expensive. Yeah, it's expensive. I'm sure you you look back and you say maybe if it wasn't for the NHS, our work, NHS yeah. would never afford yeah. to do that, and the the awareness you're raising, the funds you're raising will go a long way in helping, even if, if it's not for the entire chemo period, but you will yep. help somebody. Yep, no, somewhere. Completely. Yeah, completely. As a father, you know, you are in Charlie's life, I think almost more than the mom is. Completely. You know, completely, yeah? No, yeah? Completely. Talk to us about being a stay-at-home dad and <laughs> <It's> <laughs> the, the fact that you're catching up on what you missed with your first two kids. How was that been for Completely. You? It's, I feel very lucky and it's a privilege to be able to do so. But I see my military career as my, my career. Um, and yes, I've been pensioned off. Don't tell me I'm retired. Or Anna will say, no, you're not retired. <laughs> um, but it's given me the opportunity to be there for Charlie. And I think... Being able to be the one that takes her to school, picks her up, goes to her homework, reads a story, puts her to bed and all those kind of things, put us in a really good place so when Anna was away, there wasn't a complete turmoil of, hold on, mum used to do that, mum used to do that, mum, because that it spread across. Yeah, yeah. So it helped us with that way. Mm. Um, as you rightly said, so my other two children, I was away a lot of their time. I missed a whole lot of that. And so it's given me the opportunity to be there for her. And mm -hmm. not just support Charlie, but to be able to support Anna as well. Because mm -hmm. Anna's, yeah, Anna's Anna. And she's doing really, really well. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to be able to support that as best I can. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Would you say you have enjoyed your time in Kigali? You know, fully, you should, you should enjoy it. And I see from your work that, you know, but then we've had the ups and downs. Did you I feel like this was, was interfering with the enjoyment? I think it's... <laughs> Answer that question in any way. <laughs> yeah, no problem. So yeah. I have absolutely loved my time here in Kigali, mm -hmm. in Rwanda. Um, the turbulent, I think life isn't a flat, straight road. It's never going to be flat and straight. There's going to be things and obstacles in the way, and you just need to keep going through, and it's what shapes your, the journey that you're on. Um, 
So Rwanda as a whole has been amazing. My ability, to, because of the photography and finding the birds for both my books, I've, I've been to all the four corners of Rwanda and back again multiple times. I've spent time in all the national parks um, and even in people's private gardens because they get in touch and go, look, I've got this bird, Can, do you want to come? Up? I'm like, yes, I'm there. So mm -hmm. it's, it's allowed me to travel, I think, yeah. It, mm -hmm. it, even, even during COVID, what blew me away was the fact that at weekends, I could still go to Akagera. I could still go to Nyungwe, and I could still do all of those things. Even when it was locked down, there were corridors open to provide that, to enable that to happen, yeah. which was absolutely amazing. Mm. Um, yeah, we've, we've so enjoyed our time here. Wow, wow. The connection that you have with nature, how has that impacted your well-being and outlook life? So, I think the best thing to do is go back previously. So prior to Anna's treatment, so my time in the military, I've seen some traumatic events, experienced loss, um, being blown up, being shot at, being all the rest of it. And then Anna's been the person that, how I process is by talking, so, or had done. So I'd talk to Anna about it and we'd talk it through and then he could move on, no problem. So obviously with can An Anna's cancer treatment, she was back in the UK. She was the, p she was the one going through it. So I couldn't burden her with my thoughts. Oh. So for me, being able to get out into nature whilst Charlie was at school, to listen to, to watch and photograph birds, that it forces you, and any other wildlife, because it forces you to focus on now, what's going on now. Everything else that's going on around you, it's turned down, the volume's turned down. So you can process, your mind has the ability to work as well. And that gave me the headspace to then keep going and, and, and continue. Mm. So wildlife and birds, Birds especially, they've they kept me going well, through some did. really, really dark and difficult times. Mm. So yeah, I can't I can't thank them enough. Anything special about birds? Why why Oof. birds? Why uh, not other wildlife? So don't get me wrong, I think all wildlife is amazing and why birds? So you could go to Zimbabwe and see a giraffe. You can go to South Africa and see a giraffe. You can go to Zambia and see the giraffe, and you'll see the same giraffe in all those places. You go there and you'll see different birds in each of those places. So they're unique, they're diverse, they're, they're awesome. Um, and they play a critical role in the functioning of the world's ecosystems mm -hmm. and conservation and preservation of our planet. Without them, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't. No. How many species do we have in Rwanda? So that's a, that's a contested statement. So n not just through how many are here, but what actually is a species. Uh -huh. So you would have thought, Okay, how many birds are in Rwanda? Okay, there's a list. There's not just one list. There's four different lists, a global list of what, how many birds in each country. So it depends on where you go, and that depends on how you define a species. So I would say approximately 711 here in Rwanda. Species. Spe different species, yeah. And in Kigali itself, yeah. between 250 and 280, somewhere in that number. Yeah. So there's huge amounts. What, what, would, what would, as you said, it depends on how you, you define, define it. How you define a species. So what is your definition of species for you to get to 711? <laughs> <laughs> so there's, as I say, there's four different lists. Uh -huh. And it's just one of the lists I go with. And that's largely so it, how you define a species. And, 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 and the four different lists, lists what, yep. what brought about four different lists? Because those, depending on how you define a species, is that okay. by how they look? Mm -hmm. Is that how they feed, their characteristics their or behaviours? Or is it due to their genetics when you can take DNA testing and test it? And I think there's, wow. I, I go with the DNA testing, wow. but there's also an element of, of that. So it's a merger of the two. And that's why you get so many, difference because so many differences yeah. um, of what should be a species and what should be not a, or they're the same species. Or are they, or they different because they live in different areas and they're mm -hmm. separated by a geographical barrier. So how do you, what do you call a species? And that's where it comes from. Uh, so I say approximately 711. Yes, <laughs> going by the one list that you picked Correct, out of yeah. the three. Yep. And then your love for birds did not stop it. You're just taking pictures. You even went ahead and wrote a book about it, Falling for the Birds of Kigali. Yep. Tell us about the inspiration behind that. So as, as we've said, I posted a lot of photos on uh, social media and I think the spark for the book was... was, was was ignited on social media by people getting in touch go um, where can I get hold of these images can you put them all together so we can see them all together mm -hmm. and that was like that was a great idea so I, I looked at Kigali first because of because of the COVID lockdowns my ability to travel was mm -hmm. kind of restricted 
um, somewhat. And so I looked at the, at the city limits and what could be found within Kigali. So the aim of the Falling for the Birds of Kigali is threefold. One, to document and highlight the birds of, of Kigali, but also using a map showing where people can actually go and see them and access them themselves and find them. So that's number one. Number two was also to promote Kigali as a bird watching destination in its own right. For those visitors that only come here for, let's say, one day or two day on business, but have a spare afternoon before their flight, you don't need to travel to Akagera or Nyungwe to see amazing birds. Here in Kigali, you can find some, and you can have a great afternoon or morning just seeing those birds. Mm -hmm. So it's to highlight that. And thirdly, to highlight some of the awesome conservation work being doing here in, in Kigali by uh, Rwandan organizations to conserve wildlife. And so in the book, I look at two, um, or I give a great example of um, happening at Umasambi Village, the Rwandan Wildlife yeah. and Conservation Association. Mm -hmm. And the conservation project um, started by one man to save a species, which mm -hmm. I think is fascinating. And the next thing I look at is the wetland restoration. So what sets Kigali apart is it's built on some amazing hills, but in the bo bottom of these hills are these wetlands. Mm -hmm. And so by storing them and looking after them, which is what Kigali City and the Rwandan government's doing, they're creating an awesome environment and they're helping conserve and help the environment and the wildlife and the communities and people that live mm -hmm. in Kigali. Mm -hmm. So it's fascinating. So I wanted to highlight those two. So that's what yeah. the first book was. And you have a second one coming. I do, yeah. Yes. So this one, um, as I said, for me, photographing the birds, I then wanted to go and learn about the behavior. So I studied. And what I learned, I wanted to share. Because I want, my aim is to be able to share through my photography, but also inspire people and highlight the importance of birds. Highlight that they, we need to look after and we need to conserve them. They should be a priority in what we're doing, not just birds, but wildlife. And so it's to try and educate people about, look, these are the awesome birds here in Rwanda. We've got to look after them. And so it's to try and understand more. And by opening up their world so we understand a little bit more about them, of how they feed or how they choose a mate or the different nests they build, um, how they fly. Some, some of the birds of the 711, approximately, mm -hmm. that are here in Rwanda, mm -hmm. some of them travel from as far as Europe and Asia and only come here for part of the year. How do they navigate from there to here? So and I discussed they go back that. Home. And they go back home. Because <laughs> they breed in either Asia or Europe, and they fly here. Why? Because it's a bit cold up there during the winter, and they come here for the lovely oh temperate my conditions. Oh, goodness, yes. So, and I look at how the different birds do that, or the shape of the, a bird's beak or their wings, what mm -hmm. they're, how they've evolved and adapted to exploit different niches. Do you look at the bird families as well? Because they, they live in families, huh? They do, yes. Yeah. Um, and I, that's what I love. I, so it's what, what, what really f gets me going is the fact that each of those, of the 10,720 odd species in the world, each one of those is different. Not just in terms of how they look and sound with their, with their songs and vocalizations, but also how they act, how they interact with each other mm -hmm. and with separate species. Uh, it just, it's just amazing. <laughs> it blows your mind. Yeah. But also tell me, the birds that you picture, well, most of them are really cute. Oh my God, they are beautiful, but not common. You really have to look for them. There's one you recently posted and I reposted it and said, and somebody commented it looked like it was a mushanana, you know, fabric. Yeah, yeah. Those very cute birds are not that common. Is it because they are rare or do they live so this rich man's life where they don't mingle with the stray birds? Because <laughs> there, there's some birds that are too common. Yep. Um, yeah. So what sets, one of the things that sets I love about Rwanda's bird life and avian birds is not just its diversity of species, but its density of those species. So there's lots of, so you can go to other countries and you might see a single bird, but here you'll see a flock of them. So wow. it's, it's a concentration of those birds. Um, a lot of the birds, I think it's because actually when you live in an area, you get used to it. You take it for granted to some degree and you don't... To find the birds, we need to look up. Mm -hmm. To find the birds, we need to look down. We need to look all over the place. Mm -hmm. But actually, a lot of the time, we're all too busy and we're focused on where we're going and what we're doing rather than trying to take in. Um, and that's kind of one of the things for my mental health and mental well-being. It's the ability to stop and listen and just take in the birds and the songs and the, and the sounds around you. Mm. And it's now well documented. By doing so, it has a massive positive impact on our mental health and improves our mental well-being. Wow. 
Wow. Some scientific studies saying up to eight hours after you hear birdsong, you're in an elevated and happier mood. Mm. Well, I think that's amazing. Oh, I know I have a beautiful morning when I wake up and I hear the birds chirping. That it's not always because it depends on where you've spent the night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the times when you're in a busy place, there's all these trees and the birds chirping. It sets a different mood for the day. One hundred percent so. So do you know all the bad names or other times when you seek help? Because I will see an uh, orange, I'm on your page now, and I'll yeah. see this orange and black bird, beautiful bird, and yeah. you call it the black winged bishop. bishop. Yeah. Then there's another bird here, that color I cannot tell, and you say it's the red-billed fire finch. Yep. Okay, I know if I look for this information, I will find it. But for you, yeah. is, is this information you have on your fingertips or do you also... So Take a picture, <laughs> then you're wondering, what bird is this? <laughs> <laughs> so for someone getting into bird watching for the first time, and I did, my, when I first started getting, when I first arrived here, um, it took a long time to work out what you were photographing. And that kind of scratched the itch initially of, right, okay, what is it? No, but hold on, it looks like that one. Why is it different? And so for the first probably 12 months to 18 months, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I had, there's... There's two or three people, and what's great about Rwanda is there's a really good online birding community, both on oh. Facebook and other social media platforms, that you can reach out for help. And there's a friend of mine who's actually the publisher, my, my friend of mine called Gael, who he's the publisher of my book here in Rwanda, mm -hmm. um, but he is a naturalist that's lived here all his life. He, you, you, I'm sure you'll know mm. Gael. Uh, yeah. um, <laughs> grew up in Akagera. Mm. His knowledge of all things nature and the natural world is second to none. It's encyclopedic. So I would get my photograph and go, Gael, what am I looking at here? <laughs> and he yeah. would help me out. Um, mm. And so, but he would, rather than just help me out, he'd go, right, go and have a look at these first and tell me which one you think. So rather than just giving me the names, he'd yeah. make me work for it. But yeah. by doing so, it increased my understanding of the birds. Mm. So yes, at the beginning, it's quite hard. Oh, but gosh. That, that black winged bishop was the first time I'd seen that, and that was earlier this week just off the main road of Kabagabaga going to Kimi Ronko. After all these years of you photographing birds yep. in Rwanda, yep. that was the first, first time. time? Yep. There's one that looks very like it, which I'd seen a lot, mm -hmm. but never this one. And what would explain that? Um, because you see, we have, we have a lot of them. So how come yep. you're so only seeing it for the first time? So as, as our climate, as our conditions change, heat-wise, temperature-wise, Birds will move into areas, or we start developing a certain area, or not developing an area. Birds will take advantage of what we're trying to do within our area, so they'll exploit areas that we're not working in. And so, yeah. this bird was oh. right in an area, or Kabagabaga, just before the wetland, on an area that's waiting to be developed. So it was coming in there to have seeds, and that is a male, and he's he's bright or coloured because he's in his what we call our bre his breeding plumage. So How would you there. know he's a male? Because of the colours. Oh, because of the colours. Yeah. So what colours does the female have? It's a lot um, more camouflaged and subtle and subdued. The reason being is wow. because the female will be the one on the nest looking after it and providing food. So by being subdued and camouflaged, mm -hmm. it stops predators or reduces the risk of predators coming to the rest and snuffling <laughs> the young. So it's a great way. <laughs> God is creative. The camouflage is not by accident. No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Fantastic. Well, I wonder what advice you'd give to someone that is facing personal challenges. They want to pursue their passion, but there are all these hindrances along the way. Mm. So uh, as, I, I, as I alluded to earlier, life isn't one straight road that's flat. It's up, it's down, and there's obstacles in the road. And you've got to navigate those in the best way we can. But every single person has their own personal challenges. And you just need to keep going. If you've got a passion, keep going. I've... I think last year brought into sharp focus the fact that life is finite and we don't know how long we're going to have. So make the most of it while you can. If you've got a passion, go for it. Go for it. Yep, totally so. Yeah. Do you want to see Charlie follow your footsteps? I'd like Charlie to be happy. So mm. she, whatever she wants to do. She can go do and I'll support her. You're not going way. to be the kind of parent who will come down her throat telling her it's birds and nothing else. <laughs> In this house, it's the birds or the military. <laughs> <laughs> so birds, birds for Charlie, as I say, she's five and a half, and yet she could probably name maybe 15, 20 different birds. Already? Already. And mm -hmm. that's, that's not through me. 
pushing it down the throat. It's from her being, it, being with me and asking, I've seen a bird, what is it, Dad? Well, it, talk to me and tell me what you think you see. Mm -hmm. um, so I love the fact she's taken that in or that interest, but whatever she wants to do, mm. I'll support her and, yeah. and as will her mum. Yeah. Before we go to six cues, I want to know, because from your story, it's very clear that you and Anna support each other. Yep. 100% or be, you know beyond that what does that do to someone's esteem why is that good for a relationship what does it do uh, what does it mean to someone's mental health and I'm asking that because relationships are facing all sorts of challenges lately yep. and you've got two people fighting over the one and one another's career yep. so if you can just talk to us about that support and what it has done for you but also what you believe it's done for the relationship so i'm i've come from a, a failed marriage and i've learned my lessons from a failed marriage for me a relationship and the partnership is about communication without communication it will fall apart and without communicating, things that are very small will build and build and build and get bigger until you can't bring them back to the same place. So talk about them early, communication. Mm -hmm. For me and Anna, as I said, uh, I learned from my previous relationship, but uh, Anna's and mine and Anna's ability to talk and discuss and be there for each other, it's all about support. Mm -hmm. And it's all about, if you have that support in your corner, you kind of feel invincible that you can do anything. You've got that support, that person, right, I'm going to go. And it's, yeah, it allows yeah. you to, to spread your wings yeah. and actually go and be that person. And you it's important be. for a couple to get that support from each other. Of course as it opposed is, 100%. To it coming 100%. from outsiders. No, 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 it needs mm. to come for that relationship to work. It needs to come internally, mm. organic. Um, yeah, completely. Well, thank you for that, yeah. Communication is key. Let's take a short break. We will be back with six cues. My name is Jackie. Our guest is Will. We are talking photography, relationships. Uh, we've talked about, oh my God, I need to get Will's, which I'll do maybe after six cues. I need to know what we can do to support him as he raises funds to help those that cannot afford to go through the cancer treatment. So we will talk about that after six cues. Well, six cues is a quick one. Okay. We'll fly through the answers. Okay, okay. So question number one, what is the best life advice that you have ever received? Don't complain. If something's going wrong, be the person to fix it. Go out there and fix it. If you can't fix it, and it's something you can't actually do something about, move on to something that you can. Don't get fixated by something that you can't control. So stop complaining, go and make it work. That's it. Good advice. What's your favorite meal? As you can tell, I like my food. Um, I'd say a Sunday no, there's dinner. No, there's no evidence. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Not for that size. <laughs> I would say a Sunday dinner. And that's mm. not, not from the actual food, because I like a roast beef or a roast turkey or a roast lamb. Mm -hmm. It's actually the people around that table. So it's your friends and your family that you're eating it with. That's what makes it special. Oh, my goodness. So it's not about what you're eating. It's, it's about who you're eating it with. It's who you're yeah. eating with. I see eating as fuel. You need it to keep going. Yeah. It's the people you're eating with that make it special. Then what does friendship mean to you? Friendship is all about support. It's trust and it's honesty. But it's support, which is very easy during the good times. But it's knowing your friends are there during the bad times. Mm -hmm. That your friend can pick up a phone and ask you questions. You can be that shoulder to cry on, that support mm -hmm. network, or even advice giver. So it's mm -hmm. about support and it's about honesty and trust. Okay. And then what is the thing about wildlife that you appreciate the most? I appreciate the most what wildlife do for our planet, our ecosystems. They keep them going and they keep, without them, we wouldn't be here. What annoys you about people? <laughs> Complaining. <laughs> <laughs> they shouldn't complain. If they you spent time with me, you would hate me. I complain <laughs> quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but I try my best to make things happen. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> and lastly, what would you say to the younger Will? 20-year-old Will. Keep going. Don't mm -hmm. give up. If you get knocked down eight times, you get up nine times. Keep going. If you get knocked down nine times... Get if you get down eight times, get up nine. Nine. No, get down knocked down oh, nine okay. times, get up again wow. ten times. Thank you. As we conclude, this has been amazing. Well, thank you for sharing your story with us. And 
I would love to know more about the awareness, but also the fundraising. Yep. And I'm sure my viewer would also love to get that information. How do we help you help those in need? So on my social media pages at mm -hmm. 2W's Photography, you'll find links through, through my page to a Just Giving page where you can donate or you can find out more. So I'm posting things about awareness, cancer awareness, and about early support, and also reposting stuff that Anna's posting about that as well. Okay. So you can and find it there. probably a piece of advice to somebody who's nursing a cancer patient? You'll get through it, keep strong, and use your support network. Beautiful. Thank you for making time for us as well. Thank you for having me. 2WS Photography, you will see the Twitter handle. Please get all the information about Will, but also if you have a question that you want to ask about anything that we have touched on today, please reach out to him. He will uh, gladly respond to you. We're so happy to have had you on the show today. Please share the link to the YouTube channel so that this conversation can reach as many people as possible. If you're going through a tough time, you've had it from Will, just keep going. I guess no situation is permanent. And then, yeah, stop complaining. That's what he said. He hates that about people. It's been a pleasure for me to bring this conversation your way. Thank you. We will see you next week.